So um, Dr. Lee already gave the background of the uh, metastatic lesion. Today, I'm just going to focus on some um, the uh, primary spinal tumor and uh, go over some individual um, the tumor um, the characteristics of. Um, every year in the United States, there's about 2,000 new bone tumor that was diagnosed, and also about 6,000 new soft tissue tumor was diagnosed. Um, about 5% of the primary uh, bone tumor occurs in the spine. The in annual incidence of the primary spinal tumor is about 2.5 to 8.5 per 100,000 uh, population. The when you're dealing with the um, primary uh, bone tumor, the important uh, clinical consideration will be the age or the location of the tumor. For instance, in the age, uh, if less than six years old, likely the tumor will be malignant. Um, if the, during the childhood, the, likely the tumor will be benign, and the more than 35 years old, the malignant tumor and the, some other, you know, the um, malignant the primary tumor will be the consideration. Also, the location. In the vertebral body, uh, most likely it's going to be a metastatic lesion, multiple myeloma, chordoma, and or hemangioma. But then the posterior elements uh, likely will be some benign stuff like the annual aneurysmal uh, bone cyst, uh, osteoblastoma, uh, or the osteoid um, osteomas. The um, clinical presentation of the primary uh, bone tumor is no different from the metastatic lesion. Uh, it can be pain, can be the spinal deformity. This uh, could be a scoliosis or taticollis, uh, et cetera, and also can have some neural elements compression symptoms. Um, the back pain, obviously, is the hallmark of the um, spine tumor, uh, especially the night pain. Uh, the, we're warning that there's some um, the, uh, um, the, uh, the neoplastic process. And uh, um, the also, the tumor can cause the uh, pathological fracture, can cause the severe acute uh, pain, which is similar to the traumatic compression fracture. Now, the uh, primary um, spinal uh, tumors, uh, based on their histology and the um, biological behaviors, it can be divided into the benign tumor and also the malignant. Um, the uh, primary benign spinal tumor, including the osteoid osteoma and the osteoid osteoblastoma and the osteo uh, chondro chondroma and the hemangioma, uh, aneurysmal bone cysts, and the gen cell tumors. The um, osteoid uh, osteomas is about 10% chance occurred in the spine, and normally it's uh, between the 10 to 20 years old the male predominance. Um, the, there's a 75% chance that this uh, stuff occurred at the posterior elements. Um, rarely it goes to the uh, vertebral body or canal. The um, uh, MRI scan shows the, 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 it's not very specific, but the CT scan normally can show a radiolucent nidus, um, the visa without the uh, calcification. The bone scan normally can pick up the, um, uh, shows the uh, uptake of the nucleolite uh, at the nidus. And um, the osteoid uh, osteoma uh, sometimes can associate with the painful uh, scoliosis cases. For instance, this is a young female who has this mild curve and has uh, the, 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 the severe pain, but on the x-ray it did not really show the, um, any uh, lesion. But on the CT scan, it found that there's a, a osteoid, osteoid osteoma um, on the posterior elements, and it's very obvious on the bone scan. Um, the osteoblastoma is about like a 40% chance can occur in the spine. Uh, normally, it happens in the uh, 10 to 30 years old with male predominance too. And uh, most likely, it's going to occur at the posterior elements. Um, the, it's kind of evenly di um, distributed at the cervical, thoracic, and the lumbar spine. The, um, the, uh, normally, it's an expansive destructive lesion, common uh, extension into the vertebral body and the spinal canal and the paraspinal uh, tissues. The uh, CT scan can show the osteolytic, uh, osteosclerotic, and are mixed. Um, the, uh, with calcifications. Um, the hemangioma, 75% um, of all the uh, osseous uh, hemangiomas occur in the spine, and it can happen at any um, age group with the female predominance. The um, commonly occurs at the uh, th lower thoracic or lumbar spine. Um, the about 20 to 30 percent chance are the uh, multiple. The, as we discussed before, they most likely occur in the vertebral body. Sometimes can ex uh, extend to the posterior elements. The uh, um, X-ray and the CT always have these uh, characteristic, uh, you know, um, the uh, pictures and. Uh, um, the aneurysmal bone cyst is about 10 to 30 percent chance can occur in the spine. Um, normally happens in the 10 to 30 years old female with the female predominance. 
Now, 60% of the aneurysmal bone cysts occurs at the posterior elements. Um, about 40% can happen in the vertebral body. The thoracic spines is the most uh, likely the location of the um, aneurysmal bone cyst. Not normally, it's a spine cell uh, tumor with a thin wall and the blood filled the uh, cystic uh, cavities. The uh, bone scan can show some increased uptake, and also the X-ray and the CT scan shows the well-defined radiolucent and the, the uh, trabeculated uh, expansive lesion with sclerotic margin. Uh, MRI scan is not quite um, the, um, the, uh, um, the, uh, the characteristic um, giant cell tumor. Only about three to seven percent chance occurs in the spine. However, if it occurs in the spine, it carries the worst uh, prognosis than located somewhere else <coughs> because there's an eighty percent uh, published data, the eighty percent recurrence rate. Uh, normally, it happens at the twenty to forty years old uh, population with the uh, female predominance. Um, the location likely is going to be the sacrum, um, the and the, then followed with the uh, thoracic and the cervical lumbar spine and the, um, the most commonly is happens in the vertebral body can involve the posterior elements too and the x-ray shows this eccentric and destructive non-sclerotic margin. Um, the CAT scan uh, has a well-defined uh, lesion with a soft tissue attenu attenuation there. Um, the uh, nerve sheath tumor uh, including the sphernoma and the neurofibromas Technically, it's not a primary um, vertebral uh, neoplasm, but definitely it can cause the osseous changes. Uh, normally happens at the 20, 30 years old, but can be at you know, any age groups. Um, the x-ray, which normally can show the widening of the inter uh, vertebral uh, foramen and that the, um, the, it has a scalloping of the vertebral body. The CT scan can show the mass is along the course of the affected nerve. and. Uh, um, the primary malignant uh, spinal tumors, including the even sarcoma, chordoma, osteosarcoma, and the lymphoma, plasmocytoma, and the uh, chondrosarc uh, malignant the fibrous uh, histiocytic uh, tumors. And uh, the even sarcoma is about a 3 to 10 percent chance occurring in the spine. Uh, normally happens in 10 to 20 years old uh, with male predominance. Uh, common location is at the lumbar sacral. Um, the normally is associated with this fever and then leukocytosis as well. The um, CT scan normally shows this expansive uh, osteolytic mixed or um, the osteosclerotic <coughs> lesion. MRI scan is not a very specific um, finding as well. The uh, chordoma is about like 2 to 4% uh, of all the primary malignant bone tumor. Uh, it happens uh, the, between the um, 20 to 60 years old, and the male uh, is, uh, the is to female ratio is about two to one. Now, the location of the chordoma in the um, sacral coccygeal is about a 50 to 60 percent chance. Sphenoclival you know, is about like 40, uh, 35 percent. Um, anywhere in the spine is about 15 percent. Um, the in the spine is likely occurs in the cervical rather than the uh, thoracic lumbar the uh, ex, uh, location. CT scan, normally you can see an expansive lesion centered in the middle line with calcification. The MRI scan can sh show the low um, intensity on the T1, high intensity on the T2 with the moderate and pre prominent enhancing after the gadolinium. The uh, osteosarcoma is about th only 3% chance occur in the spine. Um, the is normally happens after 30 years old with a male predominance. And then location-wise, is about a 60 to 70 percent chance at the lumbar sacrum. The um, CT scan normally you can see the osteosclerotic and the osteolytic or mixed lesion the, uh, with the matrix of mineralization there. Um, the MRI is not quite um, the uh, specific, and this is always uh, the osteosarcoma sometimes can associate with the Page's disease or the history of the radiation. Uh, lymphoma, uh, most, li most likely is the uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The uh, spine is uh, the fourth uh, most common site for the primary lymphoma of the bone. Happens in about 40 to 60 years old and with the male predominance as well. The um, uh, x-ray and the CT scan shows osteolytic and the mass eating and the rarely um, osteosclerotic or mixed lesion. Um, the uh, MRI scan it shows this um, the uh, lymphomatosis uh, infiltration and with the um, the uh, T1 low intensity and the variable T2 and enhanced with GAD. The plasmocytoma 
is about 50% chance can occur uh, in the spine. The mean age is about the uh, 50 years old. The location wise is mainly located in the vertebral body, less likely in the posterior elements. Um, CT scan can show the uh, osteolytic expansion, uh, expansive lesion uh, with or without sclerotic uh, changes. The MRI scan shows the uh, low T1 signal and the, the high T2 signal. And uh, the plasmocytoma, good news for plasmocytoma is normally is radio sensitive, therefore, you know, it can be uh, treated with the uh, radiation. Um, the, uh, now, for the staging and the classification of the primary tumors, in the 1980, um, the Anakin and the colleagues uh, published the onco oncological uh, staging system to define the biological behavior of the limb primary tumors. In the 1997, uh, uh, Boriani group suggested a surgical staging system for the spine tumor based on the Anakin and Paunian uh, work. The, um, the uh, Boriani uh, staging system uh, is uh, used for the uh, benign tumor and the malignant tumor. For the benign tumor, there's a three stage um, the, um, the, uh, um, the staging system. The uh, stage one is normally says the tumor is latent, inactive, and asymptomatic, and with a true capsule. The uh, stage two is the, for the tumor that is slow growing and with mild symptoms. There's a very thin uh, capsule and a layer of the reactive tissue. Stage three normally says is a rapid growing and incomplete and absent capsule invaded the, the neighboring uh, compartment. Um, the, for the malignant tumor, it also has the three stages. Uh, the stage one normally is the low-grade tumor. Stage two is a high-grade, and uh, the, which within the stage one and the stage two, they also subgroup A and the B. The A is within the vertebral body. Um, B is invading the, um, the paravertebral compartment. And the stage three, obviously, is the metastatic lesion. Um, the, um, the then the uh, Boriani group went down uh, you know, develop the system for the uh, surgical planning. Uh, first, they have the, uh, divided the, the vertebral body into uh, the vertebral, um, the, the, the bone into a 12 uh, radiating zone, you know, just like uh, the uh, clock face. And also, um, they uh, from the outside to the inside, they, uh, they uh, divided the five layers. Um, the uh, so from this. They, um, it depends on how much involvement of the tumor in the vertebral body. Uh, there's, uh, they recommend there's a se several treatment options with the vertebral rectomy and with the sagittal res uh, resection or the posterior arch resection. Um, the general speaking, the indication for the surgery of the spinal uh, primary spinal tumor is uh, the we, if the patient has the spinal instability due to the bone destruction or due to the pro there's a progressive neurological deficit or there's a radio resistance tumor that is growing and the need for the open biopsy or the intract intractable pain and response to the non-surgical treatment. Now, uh, in 2008, uh, Dr. Ryans and Dr. Gogaslan, uh, they published this paper after extensively reviewing the, um, the Boriani um, the, uh, staging system. And uh, they, um, um, they recommended the intralesional resection uh, for some uh, of the benign and the malignant tumor. Also uh, recommended the unblock resection for uh, some other um, the benign and the malignant tumor. Um, in 2009, the, the Boriani and the Shaffrey um, they published this uh, paper after extensively reviewed the uh, clinical articles um, for the three, um, the kind of aggressive um, primary, um, the benign tumor uh, for osteoblastoma, um, they recommended for the non-aggressive lesions, which is anakin uh, stage two for the intralesional resection. For the aggressive tumors, uh, anakin um, stage three, uh, they recommend for the unblock resection, and uh, if the tumor was not completely resected, the radiation will be the um, the, um, the choice. However, the radiation was not shown to prevent the recurrence. Um, for the aneurysmal bone cyst, the goal is the intralesional um, gross total resection. 
Also, the embolization can be the option for the uh, preoperative embo can reduce the blood loss, and also for the incomplete re resection, they can, you can use the selective arterial embolization as a second choice. Also, the um, um, standalone the embolization selective arterial embolization right now is under the investigation. Uh, it's need the uh, uh, there's no su sufficient data to show that's uh, going to work. And also, the radiation will be the adjunct treatment for the inoperative uh, lesions and for the aggressive recurrent lesions as well. For the gen cell tumor, um, the both thoracal lumbar and the sacral uh, lesions they recommended for the unblock resection. Uh, however, there's a weak weak uh, evidence suggests that the sacral lesion, um, the this will be the best option, and that the. Um, for incomplete resected the gen cell tumors, the uh, serial clinical and the radiographic uh, observation will be needed. And also, if there's a recurrence, um, the only choice will be the radiation. The, um, con for the um, treatment of the primary uh, spinal tumor, in general speaking, the surgical uh, eradication provides the best long-term uh, benefit. Radiation chemo has a very limited role in the uh, incomplete resected or recurrent tumors. Uh, but obviously, each case has to be analyzed based on the imaging histology and the, the uh, surgical access and the patient's desire as well. Thank you. So a pathological spine fracture, again, here are my disclosures, the same as before. Um, so as, as we discussed before, metastatic spine disease is pretty common. It, and the concern with metastatic spine disease is that this can result in a pathological fracture. And of course, that can result in subsequent pain, deformity, and potentially neurological compromise. Uh, pathological fracture can come from any primary, of course, but it's been associated with myeloma 24% of the time, breast 14% of the time, prostate 6% of the time, and lung 8% of the time, according to this reference here. And the treatment really is, is widespread. It can entail rest, analgesics, bracing, radiation therapy, cement augmentation, and surgical reconstruction. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on cement augmentation and what the role for cement augmentation in the treatment of pathological spine fractures really is. So when I say cement augmentation, I'm referring to vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. And as we all know, vertebroplasty is the injection of cement into the fractured vertebrae. This is developed first. Kyphoplasty is a modification of that procedure where we, infl uh, we inflate the fractured vertebrae with a balloon, and there's a subsequent injection of cement into that vertebrae. Uh, it's associated with a lower pressure of injection and a higher viscosity of cement, which are some subtle differences between kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. Cement augmentation is indicated for a compression fracture, burst fracture, for an, an osteoporosis or pathological fractures. Typically, we want to see, have some idea of relative acuity. It's thought that the sooner we treat these fra uh, fractures after the injury, the better that they'll do. And this can be uh, judged either from history or from uh, relative edema on an MRI scan. And I'll show an example of that in a little bit. Ideally, it's nice to have a posterior vertebral wall to contain the cement, prevent it from leaking back into the spinal canal. It's not necessary, but it's, uh, it certainly is ideal. And if, the, if there is a breach in the posterior wall, one must exercise a caution while injecting that cement. And a CT scan can be useful in determining that uh, preoperatively. So here's an example of a person with a three uh, compression fractures. Uh, you can see, see on the x-ray at L4, T12, and 11, there appear to be a, a compression fractures there. It's better defined on the CT scan in the middle picture. And finally, on the MRI on the right, we can see there is evidence of edema within these bodies, suggesting that these fractures are not old healed fractures, but rather uh, there's some level of acuity and incomplete healing to these fractures. As compared to this patient who has multiple myeloma, has multiple compression fractures in their spine, if we get an MRI, we really see minimal evidence of edema within these, fra within these uh, fractured vertebrae. And that suggests that these vertebrae have healed in this position. And the suggestion is, or the thought is that cement injection into these levels may not necessarily result in pain relief, though this is under much discussion uh, currently. So to talk about cement augmentation and pathological fractures, we have to talk a little bit about cement augmentation and osteoporotic fractures because that's where the uh, literature really is uh, more advanced. As, as we all probably know, in 2009 there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is from Australia, a randomized trial of vertebroplasty for painful osteoporotic fract uh, vertebral fractures. This is a level one randomized a double-blinded controlled trial comparing vertebroplasty versus what they called a sham vertebroplasty, essentially just an injection of cement at the fracture site. And they, they blinded the patients. They would even open up cement in the sham procedure patients so the patients would smell the cement and not know if uh, they had the cement injected or not. 
And what they found from the study was that there is no beneficial effect with vertebroplasty as compared to the sham procedure. Now this is one level one study, it's, it's, it's a very good quality study, but it's only one study, and one study really isn't enough to sort of change the way we do things. We need more studies which corroborate uh, these findings. There was a second study done, and this was done in the United States, this is by Kalmas and others, and actually some of our University of Washington colleagues, uh, Comstock, uh, Patrick Haggerty, Judith Turner, Lydia Stout, Raj Gatke, and Jerry Jarvik were part of this effort, and this is essentially a parallel effort to the Australian study comparing vertebroplasty versus a simulated vertebroplasty, again just an injection of uh, anesthetic at the, uh, at, at the fracture site, and they found a similar result. The clinical improvement is similar between patients treated with vertebroplasty and those treated with a simulated vertebroplasty. Again, this is a level one prospective double-blinded randomized control trial, and because they had done the appropriate pre-study power analysis, they can statistically conclude the null hypothesis. And people are starting to pick up on these studies, suggesting that vertebroplasty may not be as effective as once thought. This is a systematic review out of the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic, uh, Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, looking at the treatment of symptomatic osteoporotic spinal compression fractures. And from the systematic review, they made this recommendation. Uh, they recommend against vertebroplasty for osteoporotic spinal compression fractures. Uh, now, vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, as you know, aren't the same thing. And when they examined kyphoplasty, they stated that kyphoplasty is still an option for patients with osteoporotic spinal compression fractures. But if you look at the strength of the recommendation, the strength of this recommendation here is strong, whereas the strength of this recommendation is weak. And that's because of the quality of evidence. It's not so much that kyphoplasty works that much better, it's just that quality of evidence isn't there. You can see for kyphoplasty, kyphoplasty there's only level two studies, but for vertebroplasty, they, they cite the two level one studies, uh, which is the reasoning for the recommendation. Now you might say, okay, fine, 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 that's osteoporotic compression fractures, but that's not tumor. So is there a difference in how patients with cancer and spine fractures respond to cement augmentation as compared to osteoporosis? Well, at this point, the literature really is inconclusive. Um, there are some suggestive studies, there are some comparative trials. This is from the Lancet Oncology com comparing balloon kyphoplasty versus non-surgical fracture management for painful vertebral body compression fractures in patients with cancer. And this is a, this is a randomized study, 134 patients were randomized, but because there's non-surgical versus a vertebroplasty, patients and the clinicians and the researchers were not blinded, so there is a, uh, that is a weakness of the study. And what they did find is that one month afterwards, kyphoplasty patients had significant improvement, whereas non-surgical patients did not. And as a result, they concluded that for vertebral compression fractures in patients with cancer, kyphoplasty is a safe and effective treatment but you have to always consider the funding of the study. This is funded by Medtronic. This is part of the CAFE study. Just because this was industry funded doesn't necessarily negate the results of the study, or it doesn't invalidate the study, but one has to take that in consideration when making your, your own assessment of the study. Now, this is a systematic review by Mendel and others looking at percutaneous techniques in the treatment of spine tumors. Um, this is another systematic review, and what they concluded was that vertebroplasty is safe and effective a method for providing pain relief and improving functional outcome. And this is a strong recommendation, but based on moderate quality evidence. So one thing we have to really understand about systematic reviews, these are a bunch of uh, experts coming together, reviewing the literature, and at some point expert opinion does pl uh, come into play. A uh, strong recommendation is, is a subjective term. It's really based on the quality of evidence as they see it. And, and as you can see, there are no level one studies here. This is based on moderate quality uh, evidence. But most of the literature for cement augmentation in patients with pathological spine fractures are really like this, case series, either prospective or retrospective case series. And 20 patients with 48 fractures treated with a cement augmentation, they have improved VAS scores uh, after as compared to before, and improved ODI scores after as compared to before. And these are valuable data, and these, these, these are important studies. They're not the highest quality studies, but they, but they do help us in formulating our, 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 our opinions. And just on a personal note, my, my, my sense is that I think patients with uh, compression fractures due to cancer can do well. I think it all relates to the relative acuity of the fracture. The sooner you get to them after the fracture, I think the more likely they are to get relief. If you wait six months after uh, the fracture and they, they have a healed compression fracture, it's probably unlikely to get much relief. And you might say to yourself, well, why all this ruckus about vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty for spine cancer um, patients? 
it's not a big deal, it's a small procedure. If, if, if they does well, if, they, if the patients do well, great. If they don't do well, well, no harm, no foul. Unfortunately, there can be harm and there can be foul. There are complications from these procedures and all you have to do is look at the case, case reports in the literature. And there's a um, case report out of uh, China look at inferior vena cava syndrome following percutaneous vertebroplasty with polymethylpathacrylate. You can see a patient's got a multi-level vertebroplasty and you can see the cement leaking into the venous system. And as a result, there's been an asymmetric blockage of that venous system and the patient has left lower extremity edema and swelling. Delayed presentation of uh, pulmonary poly polymethylmethacrylate emboli after percutaneous vertebroplasty. Here we can see on chest x-ray cement emboli, cement literally in the, in the pulmonary fields after a cement augmentation procedure. And uh, this is actually probably more common than we think it is. According to the Vertos II study, there's about a 25% rate of asymptomatic pulmonary cement emboli after a cement augmentation procedure. So, so that's uh, something to take of note. Uh, intraatrial thrombus and pulmonary thromboembolism has a late complication of vertebroplasty. Here you can see a cement spear forming uh, within the venous system here, and this was actually removed surgically. You can see it looks like a little cement toothpick just residing in the venous system, and this acted as a nidus for thrombus formation and subsequent pulmonary embolism. It kind of looks like, kind of reminds us of a K-wire in orthopedics. If we have a smooth K-wire anywhere in the body, well, we know those smooth K-wires can migrate anywhere in the body once they start to loosen up a little bit, and uh, it's kind of a similar, um, similar mechanism. Multiple cardiac perforations and pulmonary embolism after, uh, caused by cement leakage after percutaneous vertebroplasty. Uh, here you can see this, again, the cement spear or cement toothpick literally perforating the heart in multiple locations. Again, kind of like that smooth K-wire that migrates in the body. You can see this is of a sizable um, concern. Here's another example of cardiac per perforation and tricuspid regurgitation as a complication of per percutaneous vertebroplasty. And I don't know if that's projecting well, but we can see the uh, cement formation uh, perforating the heart right there. And here's a gross picture of the same thing. And finally, intradural cement leakage. Um, this is a one out of China where uh, vertebroplasty was done. Here are the post-op films, and we can see on the lateral, we can kind of see that spinal canal pretty clearly, probably more clearly than we would like. After a CT was done, we see the effect of a CT myelogram, but instead of contrast dye, that's really contrast cement residing within the dura. So big complications can occur from this seemingly small procedure. In summary, uh, for cement augmentation, we have to kind of consi uh, consider it in regards to osteoporosis because that's where it was originally designed. Um, it's suggested to be ineffective in some studies, but more studies are being done. You know, vertebroplasty isn't the same as kyphoplasty. And uh, there are some critiques of those level one studies, uh, which are legitimate, but I haven't gone into detail here. Um, for tumor patients, right now there's probably insufficient evidence um, to really conclude how effective cement augmentation is in treating these patients. And finally, complications are rare, but they are potentially devastating.